Praise the Lord. Let me appreciate the service leader. She has done a wonderful job. That is one lucky husband. We praise the Lord. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for leading us so well. And we are grateful. We have Reverend Josiah Kirusia and your dear wife, Sarah, please rise up. We want to acknowledge these servants of God, ACK Kajiado. Thank you for worshiping with us. We thank you so much. Thank you. Ask your neighbor, are you a visiting clergy? <laughs> you know, you, you could be here. Like, Pastor, why did you recognize me? <laughs> yes, Njambi Nairobi Baptist, we see you. Welcome. No, <laughs> one of us, we praise the Lord for that. Um, Brother Kiambati, it is good to see you here. And Big C uh, from BTL. And these are organizations that, as Karen Community Church, we also come alongside and support. And that's why we give them some time to come and share with us. So please, after the service, I will still encourage you to visit those desks and see what is happening there and how you can come alongside them. We have come to the climax of our services where we get to sit under the instructions of God's word because we believe God's word is alive. This is not just an ancient book that was meant for them. It is alive. It speaks to us today, revealing to us who God is. And as we know him, we can draw ever closer to him and appreciate this great love that he has for us. And of course, as a church, we are very privileged because one of the things we also have is a pulpit team, a ministry where we have people who come alongside, <clears throat> sorry, the pastoral team to share God's word. And today, our preacher is part of this team, but also is the chairman of our elders court, that is our very own brother Albert Mugo. And one of the things I love to say about uh, my supervisor and my chairman is, you know, he served at the highest levels of government and he finished well. He doesn't have to look behind if EACC are in the service. <laughs> he can serve the Lord and do so joyfully. And his love for God started in those early days when he was in university. And that's one of the things he is very passionate about, his love for God. And together with his dear wife, Reverend Phoebe. So we are very privileged to have Engineer Mugo share with us God's word today as we look at rediscovering community. So please turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. And we'll be reading from verse 42 to 47. And then we'll pray for our preacher today as we all get to hear God's word. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 to 47. Famous passage. And we pray that God will use this passage to again speak to our very hearts. If you're there, say amen. amen. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple, Together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome, brother, as I pray for you. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful as we come to you today to worship you and exalt your name. And we are so glad to know we can sit under the instructions of your word and see you reveal yourself to us through your word as you speak these words that should draw us closer to you and spur us on to be more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ. And yet, God, it is very possible for us to take it for granted that every Sunday we sit to hear your word. Lord, may it, be said, may it never be said that we took your word for granted. So, Lord, open up our hearts and minds that we may hear that which you have laid in the heart of your servant and our brother, 
engineer Albert, so that Lord, as he speaks this word, it is not that him who is speaking, it is God speaking through him as a vessel. Won't you fill him with the Holy Spirit so that God, these words will come alive as we hear them to us, as we read and reflect on that. And we too, O Lord, pray that we will be obedient to this word, not just hear us, but doers of the word. Lord, if there's anything that may distract us from hearing this word, we choose to lay it at your feet so that then this word will bear fruit in our very lives. So we are grateful, Lord, for this privilege. For we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Mm, okay. I wanted to take if you're awake. <laughs> because my notes, I expected to start preaching in the morning. So it said good morning. So I, I was using my notes and I'm seeing you also using my notes. Uh, you answered good morning. Anyway, good afternoon. good afternoon. I thank God for this afternoon when I'm here to share the word of God. Um, we, my wife and I joined current community church in January 2015. So it's slightly above nine years then since we joined. And uh, at the time that we came here, we only knew just four families. Actually, maybe some will have families because we may have known one person and not the other. Um, and, and so three of those families, we had known them from university time. And then the other one family are people that we had served with in ministry. Uh, and but we were very well received, you know, from the one when we came to current community church, and um, we then felt at home. And as we fellowshiped here, we applied for membership, and in 2019, we were received as full members of current community church. Uh, the senior pastor then, uh, Pastor Mwita, welcomed us. And my wife had just finished her duty being a pastor at Nairobi Pentecostal Church, Sitam, uh, Valley Road. And um, so the senior pastor accepted her to be part of the pulpit team. And she started uh, preaching and serving God on this pulpit here. Um, and so I found myself also being made part of that team. But I always like to say that I met my wife at university. By the way, stand so people can see you. There are some people who do not know you yet. Please, just stand and turn. Um, she's Reverend Phoebe Mugo. We met at the university in the Christian Union. And I like saying that because we met serving God, when we got married, we also made that decision that we'll continue serving God together. So she's the one who was in the pulpit team first, and then I joined her and we've continued in that ministry. But we also started getting involved in the Unchained service that was then the service for the youth um, that used to meet at 9 a.m. So we were helping Pastor Jose, Sonny, before they got married, Sami Kiari, who is an elder now with me, and, and Faith. Uh, they were not married, but also they were serving God together. So you can see what happens when you're serving God together. <laughs> it, it can go further, you know. So myself and my wife, Jose and Sonny, Sami and Faith, and I'm sure there are many other testimonies here we can get of people that have served God together, and then God has put the two lives so that you can continue serving him. Then Pastor Erica and I, um, had an opportunity to do a discipleship class that saw three cohorts, you know, cohort one, cohort two, cohort three, go through a study series called Growing a Discipleship. That's a series that's done by the navigators, and, and we had a very good time with some of the people I see serving God here passionately. Some of them fairly old Christians, but said they'd never gone through a discipleship program, and they came in and we went through that program. And I thank God for what I've seen in this church 
over that period of time. So our topic for today is rediscovering community. And uh, I was asked that to share about exploring the biblical foundation of community and its role in renewing faith. Now this topic, of course, is in line with our theme for the year, Renewed Hearts and Transformed Lives. But as you can see in our poster there, the big word there is community. So I'll start by defining community, uh, what it is, because sometimes it's good to be on the same page in terms of what we are talking about so that we don't make assumptions and I speak on something that you're not together with me about. So what is community? Uh, community is a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic. That's one definition of community. It can also be said to be the condition of sharing or having certain attitudes and interests in common. For example, people talk of a community of retired persons. I guess I give that example because I'm retired. As I said, I worked in a public service and I retired about seven years ago. And so we, we have a community of retired people. Actually, we have a WhatsApp group of people that worked in the Kenya Power Lighting Company. And so we like to keep in touch and remembering some of the times we spent there. Um, and what we see in the passage that has been read to us, we, we, we see what we could actually call a community of believers in Christ in the early church. And we'll be looking at that a little more. But Richard Millington defines five different types of community, and I list them there. You can see them on the slide. And one of them would be based on interest. And this would be communities of people who share the same interests or passion, such as sports. And I would suggest that our common interest in KCC is spiritual. That's why we're all here, isn't it? Another one is action, and this will be communities of people trying to bring about change. And I would suggest that for KCC, our action is in terms of what we do in society through spreading the gospel and leaving it out. And I must say that as I was listening to the different announcements and people that came here, I was actually very happy because I realized that it is time with what we are sharing today. We talked about spreading the word of God. Then the other one has to do with place. Communities of people brought together by geographical boundaries. And ours as current community church, it's as it were geographical boundaries in the sense that we're in this location here. And we have people that live around here, whether it's to that side, this side, north, south, west, and east. Another one has to do with practice. These are communities of people in the same profession or who undertake same activities. And I would say that in KCC, we love the Lord, his word, prayer, missions, ETC. And so in that sense, we also have practice as part of what makes us one community. And finally, the fifth one is circumstance. And these are communities of people brought together by external events, situations. And those could be, for example, refugees who are brought together by the circumstances that caused them to run away from their homes and find them in a strange land. And at KCC, we are Christians, first of all, individually, and then collectively, we have decided to meet in this church. So from these definitions, you can see why we rightly refer ourselves to ourselves as a community church. And we have all these aspects as believers. Now, what is the biblical foundation of community? I think there are many things that probably different people could look at, but I looked at the book of Genesis. 
And we see that in the book of Genesis, God's original plan for mankind was for man and woman, for that matter, to fellowship with him and with each other. From this book, we see that God would talk to Adam and Eve, and they would enjoy each other's fellowship. That is God on one hand, and then the human beings. So community was God's idea right from the beginning. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, this is what is written. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then Genesis 2 verse 18, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, what this verse shows in the book of Genesis is the fact that God wanted humans to be in a community, to be together, to do his will of tending his creation. And that is a primary purpose for believers today. And that is why one of the ministries in current community church, uh, which is currently not very strong, but I believe it should continue, is called care of creation. Because in this verses here, you see that God made man so that they could take care of the creation that God had put there. But in Genesis 3, verse 8, we find something interesting. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God, the sound of the Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I was just trying to picture this, and especially when you think about someone that you love, somebody that you like, somebody that you love to spend time with, and how you look forward to meet them and catch up with them on issues that you like to discuss and even have a meal together. And my mind probably went to that time when I was courting, time of courtship. Uh, I left university, my wife was two years behind me, but we had started seeing something in each other. So from time to time, I would go to visit her at the halls of residence. And I can tell you that I used to look forward to that time. <laughs> now, so I started thinking about God and the human beings, and the Madif. And this verse that talks about God coming and calling out to them in the garden in the cool of the day. And I started thinking of how it must have been let's say before the sin came, when Adam and Eve used to look forward to that time when God would come and, you know, say, Adam, you know, and they would come running so that they could talk to God and what a fellowship they would have. Unfortunately, this fellowship with God and with each other was destroyed by sin because in Genesis 3, verse 8b to 11, this is what we read. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? But then let's also look at Genesis 4, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? 
I don't know, he said. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, this is very interesting. So before, Adam and Eve would enjoy the fellowship that they had with God. And they would look forward to meeting with him. But after they sinned, they started hiding from God. And so when God comes looking for them, they had already hidden themselves. So the fellowship that they had with God was destroyed by sin. And also in the case of Cain and Abel, we find that because the sin of Adam and Eve was also transferred to the offsprings, that type of fellowship that would have been expected to be there between the two humans was destroyed. So just like Adam and Eve hid from God, so the fellowship between them and God was broken, that community life with God was broken, we find that when Cain killed his brother, he even had the audacity of asking God, am I my brother's keeper? Remember, God had asked him, where is your brother? Did he know where his brother was? Did he know? Yes, he knew. But what is he asking God? Am I my brother's keeper? And so you can see how bad sin can be because it destroys fellowship and it even makes us to really become very bad. And maybe I would put it to you that there may be times when we also mess up with other people and we still blame them as we seek to cover up for our sins, very much like what Cain did. It may not be that we've killed somebody, but you may have done something that is not right and then you want to cover up. And you've probably heard people saying, each one for himself and God for us all. And does that sound like something for community? No, but we say it. Each man for himself and God for us all. And that goes against the idea of God for community. So because community in this is a situation where you love and you care for one another. And if you love and care for one another, then there is no room for each one for himself and God for us all. It is each one for each other. See, deal? That's community. Now, at this point, I could mention that uh, for those of you who may have been to Israel and visited a kibbutz, anybody who has visited a kibbutz? Yeah, I can see a few hands. You may have noticed the spirit of community in modern times because there is such togetherness that it's actually mind-blowing. You, you will not believe it. Now, I understand that it's not all kibbutz that operate in the way that I'm going to describe, but quite a number of them are like that. Now, of course, some of you may ask, what's a kibbutz? Now, it, it's a place where people live as one community. So when the Jews were returning to Israel, uh, some of them came back, got the land, and created a community. So they have quite some big piece of land together, like, you know, like a big farm here, and it's fenced up, and they grow all type of crops. Some keep animals. We visited one where there were really big animals, fresh and cows, uh, which should be doing very well in Europe, but they're there in the desert. And so what they do is they, they, they literally air condition the place so that the animals can be at home. And when you see them, it's unbelievable. But anyway, they live together, they work together, they have a school in that community, they have a place where they eat together, and when they sell the products that they get from that farm, they share it equally among the families. It's unbelievable, but it happens. So when we see in the passage that we were reading about the community in the early church where people were together and sharing everything in common, 
in verse Acts 2, verse 20, 44, we have seen that kind of thing in the modern day, and it's actually possible. Now, so we saw what happened in Genesis and the kind of community that God created and how sin broke that community life. But later on, there is a chosen community known as Israel, the nation of Israel. And this was, as it were, like a foreshadow of the new Israel, which is the church, like what we are today. So Israel in the Old Testament was a chosen race to be God's channel for blessing the whole earth and bringing us back to God after the fall of mankind. And through Christ, we who are not Israelites by birth have then been grafted into the new commonwealth or community of God's people. That's why we read in Ephesians 2 verse 12 to 13 that at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we can see then that through the blood of Christ, we have been brought back to God as the new community that God has chosen to put together. The Bible also tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I'm sure some of you have memorized this verse, that even one is in Christ, he's a new creation, and that the old has passed away and the new has come. So this is the sense in which we have been made a new community of believers. And we are here today as part of the KCC community, and we need to learn to continually remind ourselves to live in this community in the way that God intended us to be as new believers. Now, so let us look at uh, our passage for today, which has been read to us by the pastor. I don't need to read it again, but I would like you to note some key words here that these people devoted themselves, devoted was a key word, to apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking bread and prayer, and there were many wonders and signs that all believers were together. And remember, one of the things we said about community is that togetherness, right? And they had everything in common, that they sold their properties and gave to anyone who had need. And then they gathered in, in the temple, in their homes, they ate together. There was gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And more importantly, the Lord added to their number daily to those who are being saved. So this passage that we've read today is an account of what was happening in the early church just after the Pentecost and the time Apostle Peter preached and 3,000 people were added to the believers. So it's a group of people that, this group of people that give us the subject of today, that community that came up. Now, so we see that the activity of the church at that time was twofold that the believers continued steadfastly, that means persisting in and continuing in the apostles' teaching and doctrine. And then the second part was that they were in fellowship, breaking bread and also keeping in prayer. And this breaking of bread could have the two aspects. One of them was like the Holy Communion that we have. But the other one is the fact that they went, you know, from home to home having meals together. 
But it's important to note that, th it, that being devoted actually means that you are loyal, you are faithful, you are committed, you are true, you are steadfast, you are constant, you are intense, and there are very many words. And I wanted to bring out those words to you so that we can reevaluate our attitude in matters of faith and commitment to God and to the community of believers here in KCC. We can see that these early believers were devoted and committed to the things that were being done by believers. What about ourselves? How would you assess yourself as a believer and as a person that belongs to this community that we call KCC? Are you devoted or do you take things casually, especially when you are asked to do something in the church here? Do you commit yourself? Do you get completely devoted or do you do it half-heartedly? Um, one of the commentaries that I read and I'll quote just some part of it, said that they not only had a mutual affection to each other, but a great deal of mutual conversation with each other. They were much together. When they withdrew from the untoward generation, they did not turn hermits. Now hermits are those people who go and live alone, yeah? So these people did not go and stay by themselves, away from the evil world, but they were very intimate with one another. And they took all occasions to meet, and wherever you saw one disciple, you would see more, like birds of a feather. And people would say, see how these Christians love one another. So they were concerned about one another, they sympathized with one another and heartily espoused one another's interest. And so they had fellowship and they worshipped together. They met in the temple and other places where they could meet. So, as these people continued in prayer, we, I could say that prayer is the backbone of our Christian lives and it's always a little sad, I must say, when you see that prayer meetings in the church are not well attended. When we used to, before COVID, before COVID came into the year 2020, we used to meet here on Thursdays for corporate prayer. And uh, uh, Sister Jane, where is Jane? Oh, she's there at the back. She can attest that on those Thursdays, if you got more than 10 people, you'd say that's a big number. Now we meet virtually. I think the number virtually has gone up now to about, say 28? Yeah, about 28. Now, for a church with slightly, with a congregation of about 250 to 300, um, only a tenth is attending corporate prayers. So I leave it to you to see how that is looking like. And I would compare to this community of believers that is described in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. I think we are not doing very well there. But we're also told on, in verse 47 that these people, this community of believers, abounded in thanksgiving, continually praising God. And I suggest that they should be part of our daily living, appreciating God for all that is done for us. Now, there's a common greeting in Kenya. I call it a greeting because sometimes that's what it is. How does that go? Praise, praise the Lord. It's now become a greeting, right? Because even in political rallies, a politician comes and what does he say? Praise the Lord. One has a few, and it's repeated a few times. Not that it's bad for that to happen. And when I was thinking about this, I actually suspect that this mode of greeting each other uh, must have come up from a revival movement. 
I, I, I do believe that it was not as empty as it is today. It was something that was very real to the people who are saying praise the Lord. And, and I, I do say it to believers, but sometimes because of the way I see it being used, I'm a bit shy of doing it. So like, like here in church, I would do it because I, I know that when you're saying praise the Lord, you're genuine. But occasionally, I'm in some forum where, you know, the people I'm with come and when they start addressing people, praise the Lord, praise the Lord again. And when I come up, I don't do it because I feel like we are watering down what it is unless I can explain why I'm praising God. But, you know, these believers at that time, one of the things they were doing was just thanksgiving and praising God continually because they appreciated what God had done for them. And I think for each one of us, we have a reason to praise God. And of course, I'm not condemning that greeting of praising the Lord because there are times when you truly have a reason to praise God. And even as you meet another believer and you hug them and shake their hand and you tell them praise the Lord, you really mean it. And I suggest that it is good for us to do this. I used to hear that in the, old, in the early church, especially around the time they were celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would greet each other with a greeting, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And what would the other one answer? He is Lord indeed, right? Now, and that was a good greeting because I understand at that time, they were also being persecuted for their faith and for their belief that Jesus Christ was Lord. And they were being accused that they did not recognize the Emperor Caesar as Lord. And that is why, you know, for them to say in public that Jesus is Lord and for another one to respond is Lord indeed, it was not something that was simple. So when we praise God, when we acknowledge his goodness to us, we need not feel shy because we know what he has done for us. But we also see in this text that these believers were very loving towards one another and very kind. Their char charity was as eminent as their piety or holiness. And they were joining together in holy ordinances. They were knit in their hearts and they very much endeared themselves to one another. Now, Jesus Christ, our Lord, taught and prayed for his disciples to love one another and to be united. In John 17, verse 21 to 22, which I didn't put there, say, you know, he prayed for them to be one, even as he and the Father were one. And one of the other things he said was, I'm not praying for these ones only, but I'm also praying for those that will believe through them. And you know we're the product of those ones? So you know also Jesus prayed for us? So Jesus did pray for us as a community of believers that we may be one, that we may love one another. Now, of course, loving each other and being one as Jesus and God are one, that's very deep because we are nowhere near to that. But at least we are being reminded. So these people were selling everything and giving to those that were in need and we can learn something here from them. In the case of our community or in the context of our community, what is it that we can do? And Loving was here, uh, my school captain, Gambati. He was my school captain. When I was in Form 5, he was in Form 6. So I respect him, and when I see him, you know, serving God, I, I, I feel happy about it. He talked to us about Loving and all the things that we can do to touch other people, to show our love through Christ. Love through Christ is what loving stands for. So we become effective in the community in proportion to how much we love God. 
So if we love God, then we'll also support what Love Inc. is doing. And of course, as he explained, even when people come here to church to seek for help, material help, we do refer them to Love Inc. because of the database that they have. They can check out what is happening, whether this is a genuine case. Because some of the people who come to seek help are con men. They are not genuine. And you remember our senior pastor a while back made an announcement here and, and was trying to alert us to be careful because, you know, we do have people with not so good intention coming to us here and they are con men. But in spite of that, we are still called to love as God has loved us and as God has blessed us. So we also need to be able to love others. Jesus, our Lord, loved God dearly, and he declared that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what he said in John 4, that for now who sent him? God the Father is the one who sent him. So his food was to do the will of him who sent him and to complete it. Now, what about us? Are we also sent by God? Should we also do the will of God? Do we love God? As we love God, then we are being called upon to also think of others that we can reach out to and touch as a community. As uh, we try to get to an end or conclude this sharing, Romans 12, verse 15, tells us, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn. Now that was the writer admonishing us. And what this means is that, you know, we know that in life, it's not always the case that we rejoice with those who rejoice. As a matter of fact, there are times we, we feel bad when the other people are rejoicing. <laughs> Does that happen? Especially when we have problems and we see other people are rejoicing. It's so hard to rejoice with them. Sometimes we may think perhaps they are showing off, so why should we rejoice with them? But the word of God tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and uh, to mourn with those who mourn. And I think that in KCC, we've tried to do that a lot, and we should continue doing it. We should celebrate with each other in good times, in the weddings, in the new births, anniversaries, graduations, new homes that people have built, and these things are commendable when we do them as a community of believers, because we're rejoicing with each other. But in the same way, we also need to be there for each other when people are mourning, when people are going through difficult times. And I want to thank God for the great effort that our pastors in particular, and various fellowships in KCC, the efforts that they make to visit and to support those that are bereaved. Have you been visited and felt good when you're going through a difficult time? Thank you, pastors. Thank you, fellowships, the ladies' fellowships, the men, and each one of you, when you have reached out to touch somebody when they are going through a difficult time. There's something here that says that these people had all things in common according to the law of friendship. Now, that is why we also need to cultivate that communityness of being able to share things with each other. Uh, I know that that, verse, that passage talks about people selling everything that they had and bringing it in. And I, I, I tried to research a bit, reading the commentary a bit and finding out what is this. Now, one of the commentators said that uh, some people actually thought that Christ was coming back very, very soon. And instead of keeping things that would then be left behind, they thought that they should sell them and bring them, then they can use them for that work. I can see Pastor Leonard looking at me, you know he's a very good Bible student, and he's wondering, but that's why I said, I read a commentator saying that, I'm not saying it myself. So, 
uh, so we are not being told here that you go and sell everything that you have, but we are, we, we are actually being encouraged to be open-hearted and also open-handed so that we are able to, from whatever is in our hearts, as our hearts are open to help others, we may also put that into action. But there's a quote I also saw in a commentary here that said, um, this selling, this was to destroy not the property itself that was being sold, but selfishness. This was extraordinary liberality, like the children of Israel in the wilderness towards building of the tabernacle. And in Exodus 36, verse 5 and 6, this is what it says. The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work of the Lord, the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent his word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more. Brother Noah, are you there? <laughs> I think, I think uh, <laughs> we can learn from these people according to how God has blessed us that we too can give in an extraordinary way. Now, I, I, I asked Noah because Noah was here a little earlier. Uh, he, had, he chairs our resource mobilization committee. But he's been here very many times, appealing, and sometimes you actually pity him. That he's trying, you know, it's like trying to get, it should not be. So I look forward to that day, Noah, when you come and stand here, and you'll be appealing to us very passionately. Now, don't give any more. <laughs> we have got all that we need to put up that, to put up the other, because this is what community does, especially when we love God. And I challenge us that uh, we need to get to that level because even Paul in 2 Corinthians 8, 3, recognized those who gave as much as were able to and even went beyond their ability, ability to give. So, and because of what these people were doing in that community of believers, there was fear upon everyone. That's what we see in verse 43. And there were signs and wonders done by these ordinary men. They did not have the pomp and the robes that the Pharisees and the scribes were wearing, and yet they had abundance of spiritual gifts, and they were truly honorable in the true sense of being honorable. Not, not, not the one that we loosely use, Mwashimiwa, honorable so and so. No, these people are really honorable, even though they were ordinary men, because they were genuine and they did what it is that God was putting in their hearts. So as we finish, let me put it this way. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, the Lord said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These saints of the early church that we've read about in that passage that we read did exactly that. And we too must leave our faith out for the world to see and be attracted to our God as a community of believers. Because when they see our love, when they see what we do to each other, then we can fulfill that verse that the Lord spoke to the disciples. And verse 47, the very last one, reveals that the Lord added to their number daily. Now, one of the things I like is the fact that almost any, every time somebody stands here to lead the service on Sunday and they ask whether we have a visitor, have you noticed that there's always a visitor? God is adding to a number, but I'm sure even more can come as we continue as a community of believers who love the Lord, God will continue to add to a number, not only the physical numbers, but also people that love God and that are ready to do their work. So as a community of believers in KCC, we provide opportunities to get involved in the life of others so that they feel the communal warmth. Earlier, 
we talked about the live groups, the Bible study that happened in our neighborhoods. We have families in the ladies' fellowship, different families. In the men's, we have the Shuja groups for men of similar age groups. And we also have ministries in the church, like missions, social action, ushering. You see people ushering here on Sundays. We have the prayer ministry. We have the family life ministry that was leading us last month. Sunday school teachers, every time people are being asked, Would, can you teach Sunday school? We have the music team that is here. So we can plug into these ministries so that we don't just come to church on Sundays and then we go home and never get involved in those fellowships of believers and prayer meetings. Because I suggest that if the only thing you do is to come on Sundays, you listen to what we talk and you disappear and you don't get involved in these ministries, you're actually missing big time something to do with community. It is when you get involved, it's when you plug in and be part of what is happening here that you can now be true to the motto that we have there on that poster, that current community church is a place to do what? To belong and a place to become. That motto, if we really get involved, takes a real meaning, a completely new meaning, as you get involved in the life of the church. That is what the early church believers rejoiced in, in the goodness of God as a community, and we too should enjoy the life of togetherness as a community of believers in cases in very practical ways uh, that will bring joy and encouragement to one another as we bring glory to God. So may God bless you abundantly as you make up your mind to be involved in the community of believers here in KCC. Praise the Lord. Do you have a reason to praise God? Yes. Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you for that wonderful reminder. As we come to the end of the service, I want you to reflect on that word. What are you devoted to in our community? What, what, what excites you? about being with your brothers and sisters here. And as we reflect on that, God has done so much for us, blessed us through Christ Jesus, made a way for us to call him Abba Father, our dear Father. And that's the community that God calls us to. And as a church, we have intentionally Made sure we have a cup of tea <laughs> that we can get to know one another. I was talking to a friend yesterday and he said he stopped taking tea because nobody talks to him. He just leaves church and he goes. But may the Lord encourage all of us to know that there's a reason why God has allowed you to be part of this community. You belong. We need you. We need each other. May we be devoted to this community, to the apostles' teaching, to God's word, to this fellowship, to prayer, to the breaking of blood. Where are you devoted when it comes to the things of God? Let me request us to rise up as we sing this song, Bind Us Together, O Lord. As we reflect on that, how are you contributing to this binding together?
this is our prayer, you will bind us together. Thank you that, Lord, your word to us has been very consistent. You're calling us to be one body because we have one God and one King purchased by the blood of Jesus. Lord, the things that bring divisions, we want to bring them to you. And most of it is sin that breaks community and pride of life. God, we pray that those are things that we leave behind us that we can look for opportunities to be one with others, to reach out to them, commune with them, enjoy others. That, Lord, we will be looking out for those who are even new among us to welcome them, that they may also feel this love of community. God, we live in a world where it's very easy to just think about self. But may we break that kind of thinking because you have called us to this great love that we can share with us. Thank you for your word that has come powerfully to us. May we be devoted to this word, living in obedience to it. May we be devoted to fellowship. May we be devoted to prayer. May we be devoted to breaking bread with others in every aspect of our life. Those are the foundations of community that you have called us to live together. And so God, I pray for anyone who may be carrying heart in their hearts today, that something didn't go right in this community, that they will find healing in the arms of Jesus. That the hard hearts that sometimes we carry will be broken and exchanged with these hearts of flesh that are willing to invite others into our spaces, that we can walk with them and bring them closer to God. It's only you, O oh God, can do that in our lives. But thank you for the gift of Jesus who makes a way where there seems to be no way. That we can be reconciled and we can be known as the children of the Most High God. So we thank you, O oh Lord. And as a church, we pray, bind us together. Bind us together that we can live for you in action. A community that impacts the world through word, prayer, care, missions, and lifestyle. This is our prayer, O oh God. Let, let us meditate on these words, O oh God, throughout this week to the glory and honor of your name. This is our prayer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Please turn to somebody as we share the words of grace. And I want to request all of us to allow our visitors to be the first to live with the ashes so that then they can also not get lost anywhere, but they can also find some wonderful fellowship. Uh, our ashes will send them to lead them to our Caribou Lodge. So please send to somebody and share the words of grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our visitors, please. We will be very privileged to have you follow our ashes. Thank you for those who are leading them. God bless all of us as we sing Bind Us Together. Bind us together.